Hello, my name is Ersa Angelini and it's my great pleasure and honor to have been invited today to give a keynote presentation on a project that we've been working on for the past 10 years at Columbia University, looking at unsupervised learning and domain adaptation for subtyping of emphysema on very large cohorts of long CT scans. So to start with some background information, we are looking at the respiratory system and in particular emphysema and association with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. COPD is the fourth leading cause of death in the world. It affects 16 million of subjects in the US. And emphysema um, is, uh, corresponds to destruction of the alveoli walls, those small units here in charge of uh, gas exchange. Um, emphysema is smoking related, it's age related, but it's also genetic related. And the exact mechanisms for developing emphysema remains mostly unknown. So the baseline hypothesis for all this work was that uh, long texture learning for emphysema subtyping can advance COPD disease understanding. So we're using computed tomography, CT scans, to look at the lung structures. And those are acquired in the single breast hold, uh, which is enabled by modern CT scanners. So those are very large uh, image files with a sub-millimetric resolution, large matrix size, and uh, intensity values, which are calibrated in Huntsville unit, but which are also in a very large range of value, from negative to positive. So if you talk to clinicians, they tell you that, well, you have 40 megavoxels of lung tissue to look at in a single scan, and that should enable in vivo study of lung structure and disease patterns. And in particular for emphysema, this is an illustration here of a subject where you can see those small pockets of air which are corresponds to regions of emphysema and this can be small like this or this can be uh, much larger as in this example here in the bottom. So quantification of emphysema has been done for years by clinicians and uh, using a very simple approach based on the histogram of the um, scans and they typically would use um, thresholding at a fixed value, for example, minus 950 Huntsville unit to um, compute what we call percentage of physema, which is the percentage of lung that is um, below this threshold value. Um, sometimes people also use uh, things a little bit more sophisticated like percentile density to define the threshold based on the individual CT scan. In parallel, subtyping of emphysema is also an old idea and has been defined at autopsy, leading to uh, three very standard, what we call standard emphysema subtypes that have been used a lot in the clinical world, and those are called the centrilobular emphysema, the panlobular emphysema, and the paraceptal emphysema. Unfortunately, when you ask a radiologist to score or to localize and, um, this type of emphysema on an individual CT scans, there's very limited inter-rater agreement. So this project all started with the data, and basically clinic, clinicians at Columbia University coming um, to us and uh, you know, seeing if we would be interested in collaborating and working on Amphysiva subtyping, given the very large cohort uh, they had access to as being part one of the screening center for the acquisition of those images. So, uh, those cohorts are called MESA, spiromics, and MCAP. MESA stands for Multi-Ethnic Study of Atherosclerosis. Spiromics stands for Subpopulation and Intermediate Outcome Measures in COPD. And MCAP, which is a smaller, older cohort, stands for Emphysema of Cancer Action Program. So that's uh, the uh, initial uh, table of data we were uh, working with. And um, you can see the different uh, studies here. Uh, the number of uh, patients with CT scans, total number of CTs, etc. One thing to note is that um, MESA is what we call a non-disease cohort, as it uh, didn't focus initially on lung disease, and there are a significant number of non-smokers recruited in this cohort, while spiromics is a disease-specific uh, cohort, uh, which enrolled people who smoked more than 20 pack years. Um, the other thing to uh, notice here is that um, both uh, cohorts here have GWAS data uh, enabling genotyping of uh, any um, markers we um, would discover on those data. So um, as a start, we, when you balance the, uh, the positive and the challenges, 
aspect, on the positive aspect, this is those are mass massive prospective and longitudinal cohorts with a follow-up of up to, up to 10 years in MESA and uh, here three years at that time in Spiramix. Um, it's multi-centric, which is really good for machine learning. Um, those are standardized CT protocols with quality control, which means basically this is the best you can um, hope for uh, in terms of uh, long CT scanning. Um, data comes with state-of-the-art quantitative clinical measures of respiratory symptoms. And um, the lung and the airways were segmented by a single uh, reading center, which is also good to have some uh, um, systematic um, uh, reading um, by a single center. Uh, on the challenging side, uh, well, it represents 10 years of uh, CT scanner generations, and uh, this technology evolves quite a lot over the years. Um, this means also that even for a single generation of CT scanner, you have um, multiple scanner types to deal with. And um, when you deal at this level of uh, numbers of uh, CT scans and participants, there's always a huge effort for database management. And finally, you get into um, MESA and Spiromix governance, and which I will talk about in the next slide. So overall, uh, 11,000 full-long CT scans, 35,000 cardiac scans for over 12,000 participants over up to 10 years of follow-up. So when you want to work with MESA and Spiromix data, you basically enter what I would call a multi-centric cohort ecosystem in the sense of a complex network or interconnected system. And um, you can, uh, both cohorts have a public website with a lot of very interesting information. And as you can notice, they also have some uh, tabs here, which are called publications and ancillary studies, and the same here for Spiromix. And those uh, two tabs are basically uh, governed by two different committees, the Publication and Presentation Committee and the Ancillary Studies Committee. So the first thing you need to do if you want to do any kind of analysis on um, those cohorts is to get some ancillary study approved, which means you need to write a mini grant, mini proposal uh, with uh, quite detailed strategies on terms of uh, your hypothesis, what you want to look at and how you want to look at it and what type of outcome and uh, advancement um, that would lead to. And um, if you want to submit that for uh, uh, for funding for a grant call, you need to be basically prepared eight weeks before the deadline. So your whole calendar is completely shifted and you live in a kind of a very different schedule as um, anyone else. And um, also, uh, whenever you want to write a paper, you also need a paper approval. And if you want to write to submit a paper to a conference with a specific deadline, your calendar is also shifted by several weeks ahead of the deadline so that you get the, your manuscript or your, even your abstract approved by the specific committees. The other thing to, uh, which is a little bit of a constraint is that it is your responsibility to avoid any overlap with manuscripts already in progress or published, which means if you want to replicate a study that has already been done, you need very good reasons for that and you need to convince the committee that you have a good reason. And finally, um, you need to have all co-authors approving and having seen and approved any proposal you submit. Um, so you cannot include any last minute co-authors in this kind of uh, ecosystem. So when we started about 10 years ago, uh, the first thing we, we looked at is uh, what's the current state of the art in terms of quantitative emphysema analysis on CT scans. And basically there were um, no emphysema segmentation tool available. Um, the machine learning was only done in a supervised fashion, mostly by a group in Netherlands. Um, we had a feeling that uh, spatial localization would matter, uh, as uh, we knew from even the standard radiologic uh, physima subtypes that there were some different prevalence in different regions of the lung. Um, and there were other cohorts um, also emerging in the field of lung CT scans, in particular around interstitial lung disease and also the um, COPD gene, which is another massive cohort with um, lung CT scans. Right, on the other hand, um, we also had to think ahead about uh, using uh, cardiac CT scans for, to look at the lung, which might sound like a crazy idea, 
but not to the clinicians uh, who already had a paper um, published in Academic Radiology showing that, uh, or claiming that uh, um, you could look at personal emphysema at population level with a, a very good accuracy um, on cardiac CT scans, even though you have degraded resolution and you could see only two thirds of the lung region. And this was anyhow critical for us to uh, aim for the same type of uh, uh, analysis on cardiac CT scans because most of the scans we were given were actually cardiac scans and all, that was also the only option for us to perform longitudinal studies over 10 years which was really the goal of the collaboration. Um, there are some extra data uh, that come again with those CT scans. Um, lung masks were provided by VIDA. Um, emphysema of course uh, uh, masks were available by just using simple thresholding. We also had some visual annotation of standard emphysema subtypes uh, on a subset of scans, which was done by one of our clinical collaborators. And also, we at some point, we were given um, upper limits of normal in personal emphysema values, which are basically adjusted um, individual uh, reference value of the expected or the normal percent of emphysema. Uh, for a given person, um, taking into account covariates such as hey, sex, height, race, ethnicity, BMI, and age. Um, so, based on all that, uh, the second uh, hypothesis here is that emphysema is common in the general population in the absence of COPD, which was a really good news for us because we had to start working with the MESA cohort, which is again the non disease cohort in terms of emphysema. And as uh, shown here, if you look at um, baseline scans, the person of physima in those scans has a median value of only 18 person, which reduces quite a lot the number of success of interest in the CT scan, but which is still quite reasonable. So having all that and discussed with the clinicians, the uh, mission uh, that we were given is to study and um, seek purely radiological emphysema subtyping, which means we had no access and um, no use of any demographic or clinical measures. But, of course, we had information on scanner type and or, or, and or uh, reconstruction filter type that were used for, per scan. So to conclude on this background um, information, the first thing we had to do is to develop our own segment emphysema segmentation tool, which would be really reliable on the, at the individual level. We did that using a hidden mark of mesh field, um, and we call the associated person of physima the HMMF person of physima. And so it's a statistical method um, and uh, leading to a pixel-wise labeling of emphysema, and which was published here. And uh, one of the things that took us a lot of time is actually the parameter tuning, for the, especially for the spatial regularization, which is illustrated here as image quality, again, can vary a lot, even for the same subject um, scan with um, um, two CT uh, acquisition using different reconstruction filters. So um, without any ground truth, the um, thing we looked at is the evolution in time of the personal physima at the individual level to see if our approach would seem to be uh, provide a robust measures and possible measures of progression of emphysema in time. And as you can see here, um, our measure um, grows steadily over years between 2004 and 2010, while uh, thresholding um, can show a lot of variation and especially decrease in um, emphysema measurement uh, if you uh, change kinotype. And um, the one, th one interesting thing that we saw here is that if, if you do a little bit of Gaussian smoothing prior to thresholding, that stabilizes a lot your measure, even though it's still not really completely um, reliable. And so, again, as a proxy of validation of our um, approach, we use normal um, subject here from MESA. Um, and we showed that on the population level also, we had a very um, steady um, increase of emphysema over years using our segmentation method and that uh, the, the rate of increase corresponded to the clinical rate that is used as the reference in um, by clinicians. So what we learned in this first phase is that uh, CT scans vary greatly despite what, what you can read in a textbook, um, that uh, parameter tuning is key and can, be, uh, can take a lot of time. Uh, Gaussian filtering can help in this type of data where um, you have uh, lots of texture, but also uh, quite some 
noise sometimes and um, using normal cases was really key for us in this initial phase of development. Now moving on to the method section, I'll uh, go over our strategy for spatial mapping, unsupervised learning and domain transfer. So um, the development took, uh, for unsupervised learning took about uh, four years, uh, spending the first year on uh, again gathering, preparing and learning the data knowing that uh, we only had images in our hand and that deep learning was not yet an option at that time. And we actually spent uh, quite some time on um, agreeing on um, the best way to sample region of interest or I in the individual scans, knowing that um, it was not possible to um, use uh, all Fizima uh, RIs from uh, all individual scans. Um, then we spent basically three years doing unsupervised learning and uh, iterating very regularly with our clinical collaborators to discuss those subtypes um, and um, inspect them via, uh, you know, for example, uh, looking at their appearance, their spatial prevalence, as illustrated here, and um, iterating with them so that uh, we, everybody was convinced that the subtypes are plausible, are reproducible, and are meaningful. And that goes through, again, a lot of um, uh, evaluation metrics, such as uh, measures of reproducibility, uh, measures of association with uh, clinical symptoms done by the collaborators, and also uh, measures of uh, association with the standard of physical subtypes. Uh, once we were all happy with uh, our um, subtypes, we then moved on to the and all the cardiac CT scans and being able to um, label um, physical subtypes on those scans and this is where we use deep learning. And um, basically after four years we were ready for the final end goal of the project which is um, um, genetic association between emphysema subtypes um, and, uh, and genes. And this is done via GWAS analysis, this is performed by an external collaborator and so that you know, those uh, uh, analyses are really uh, massive efforts. They need um, as many samples as you can, but uh, uh, in the thousands. And um, they are very costly to run. So basically, you only reach that stage once the clinicians are completely um, uh, persuaded that uh, what you have um, in hand and what you're proposing is really a solid um, biomarkers. So our approach, uh, we started with a standardized lung shape um, spatial mapping because we wanted to um, have access to spatial localization. And then we developed a two-stage unsupervised framework combining spatial and texture information. And finally, again, domain adaptation was used via adversarial deep learning to handle the CT, the cardiac scans. So regarding the lung shape uh, spatial mapping, we used a very old uh, idea of encoding shapes using Poisson equation. So um, having um, a lung shape here, we are segmented with a lung mask, we first define a patient-specific core position inside the lung, and then uh, we, encode, we use Poisson diffusion to uh, encode every voxel, voxels in the lung with a radial uh, coordinate that uh, defines the distance from the core to the peel, the peel being the uh, outside surface of the lung. And we also augmented that with uh, two uh, radial coordinates, uh, theta and phi here, so that we also could encode the position in the interior, medial, posterior, lateral uh, plane, and also the inferior to superior plane. So this is what we call now Poisson distance conformal mapping. And um, this is uh, actually really nice to have such tool to um, specially align lungs without uh, requiring any registration, and this is a uh, uh, very analogous to what is done in uh, neuroimaging to map, to map brains on spheres. And um, just with this simple tool, we were able, for example, to generate um, first-time uh, atlases of uh, the lung. For example, here, just looking at uh, um, the Hansfield units of, uh, uh, within scans. And uh, on this small cohort of non emphysema uh, subjects, uh, if you uh, project the average intensity uh, values in a normal population, you end up by visualizing very clearly what is known as the gravity effect, and which leads to um, having um, uh, attenuation values in the anterior part of the lung with um, darkest um, uh, attenuation values than in the posterior part of the lung. And uh, from this uh, normal uh, population mapping, then we can also 
for example, generate relative intensity projections in emphysema population. And this is using the uh, sub-cohort that was uh, visually annotated by experts as being dominated by central lobular, panlobular, or paraceptal emphysema. And again, there's lots of information here that uh, you can um, you know, evaluate. And for example, confirmation that the paraceptal emphysema has a preferred um, um, uh, or darkest here with the darkest sensitivity prefer localization toward the peer rather than the core of the lung. All right, then the first step for the really, uh, um, in the sense, the unsupervised learning was to encode uh, regions of interest, RRI. So we uh, used um, a cubic RRI of this size and uh, we equip each individual RRI with a uh, particular um, sampling strategy inside the lung um, in terms of uh, uh, texture features and spatial features. The texture features were based on the text and dictionary, while the spatial features, again, I uh, used the location encoding that I just presented in the slide before. And then we used a very classic, first in a, as a first step, a very classic clustering approach where we iteratively update a right assignment in an individual uh, lung texture pattern, uh, LTPs. So by minimizing a dedicated cost function, which uh, is composed of uh, three terms um, to um, constrain texture distance, to enforce spatial regularization, and um, to um, also enforce uh, some texture penalty differences. We worked with uh, an arbitrary large number of LTPs in this first step, and here we chose just to work with uh, 100 LTPs. Once we have those, uh, the centroids for those 100 uh, LTPs, we move to step two, where we define what we call spatially informed lung texture patterns, SLTPs. And for that st um, step, we chose to uh, use uh, the InfoMap graph partitioning um, algorithm, which is fully unsupervised in the sense that uh, it also decides uh, itself on the uh, final number of clusters. Um, to encode this, uh, the similarity um, between the nodes in the graph to be partitioned, we uh, relied on a notion of uh, replacements and uh, saying that two LTPs are similar if they replace each other when one is removed out of the pool. Doing that, we moved from 100 LTPs to 10 SLTPs. All right, in terms of evaluation, once uh, everybody uh, was happy with uh, this uh, type of pipeline, what we did is uh, use the spiromics, so the disease cohort, that we first split into two um, uh, subsets, which we call training set one and two here, and we learned um, SLTPs using those two subsets independently. So we end up again with a, a series of 10 SLTPs which have some similarity, visual similarity, and also some similarity in terms of spatial prevalence, which is encoded here. And what we did for uh, as a validation is to measure two things. One is the reproducibility of uh, SLTPs across those two learning experiments. And we measured reproducibility at the regional level as a percentage of labeling, labeling overlap of test RRIs, and also at the individual level, measuring the correlation of S SLTP histograms within individual subjects, and both reproducibility were super high. And finally, we also tested the ability to encode uh, for those subtypes to encode the standard emphysema subtypes, which is very important in terms of clinical um, relevance, and uh, intraclass correlation were very high for the three um, subtypes. Moving on, then we retrained again using the whole spiromic, uh, spiromics cohort now, and we decided that that would be our final SLTPs. So with those, we, which ended up again to be 10, we uh, moved on and, and labeled all the sca individual scans in Spiromics and in MESA, leading to those very uh, nice uh, uh, maps, but also to histograms, which are a kind of signature of uh, emphysema in individual subjects. And using those histograms, we performed some population clustering to see if we could maybe further uh, reduce the number of SLTPs. And we actually did, and we moved on from 10 SLTPs to six quantitative emphysema subtypes, or QES. And those subtypes were uh, reviewed also by collaborating radiologists who agreed with the um, uh, aggregation of SLTPs and who also came up with nice names for those uh, QES. 
So currently, we have six QAS, which are called Apical, Diffuse, Vanishing Lung, Senile, and two CPFE type. CPFE stands for Combined Pulmonary Fibrosis and Emphysema, and those two types are either restrictive or obstructive. Having those QES, if you look at their um, distribution in the whole population, you can see that, uh, well, you can see several things in comparing MESA and spironics. First, you can see that some um, QES are rare, and especially the vanishing lung is only observed in the disease cohort. Um, the uh, egg pickle is also very prevalent in the spironics, the disease cohort, where it's quite rare in the normal cohort. On the other hand, for example, the senile QES is um, equivalently um, prevalent in uh, the two cohorts, which uh, um, tend to make sense. The second thing we looked at is the clinical significance of those QES in spironics and MESA, and that means uh, measuring association of QES with uh, respiratory symptoms, physiology, and prognosis. So there's a lot of information here. This is for individual QES here per um, columns. And um, the red shading basically indicates statistically significant association in the sense of worsening symptoms, while the blue and green shading in indicates uh, statistically significant improvement. And we also um, evaluated here um, association with outcomes such as hospitalization and mortality. So being done with uh, the discovery of emphysema subtypes on full lung, CT scan, we moved on to uh, labeling those uh, same subtypes on cardiac CT scans. And uh, while everything looks good uh, when you look at an axial slice of those such cardiac CT scan, you immediately uh, realize that when you look in the longitudinal direction that you've lost a lot in terms of um, texture um, resolution. And this is because of a factor of five in slice thickness between full lung and uh, cardiac CT scans. So basically, we are facing three challenges. First, we are missing the apical region uh, of the lung. Second, we work with degraded texture. And third, we have to handle a very large set of uh, scanner types, which uh, varied a lot across uh, several years. So how do we do the um, emphysema subtype labeling? Obviously, we can't uh, work directly as um, before, and we need to um, be quite uh, innovative here. So the first thing we needed is actually to uh, detect where emphysema was present in those cardiac scans. And so we had to uh, figure out a, a way to perform emphysema segmentation. And then once we have the emphysema uh, voxels in those scans, uh, we, uh, to perform the labeling, we exploited deep learning and, uh, for domain adaptation. And uh, this deep learning, basically, the, the key idea for this deep learning was that we um, have full lung CT scans with uh, ground truth uh, labeling of uh, emphysema subtypes, and we generated synthetic cardiac scans with, to be able to have a supervised learning of the labeling and um, uh, added to a domain adaptation so that uh, what we were doing on the synthetic scans could be applied to the real cardiac CT scans. And at the end, we ended up with uh, 17 over 17,000 longitudinal cardiac and full lung CT scans being labeled with emphysema subtypes. So scanning up a lot what we were able to uh, provide for the final um, GOS analysis. So first, uh, regarding the segmentation, where well, we revisited the HMMF segmentation method and we spent uh, quite some time uh, in uh, doing parameter tuning for um, the, all the hyperparameters of the method. So for the full long CT scan, um, as I mentioned, we uh, ended up having scanner-specific parameters to especially to parameterize the, uh, distri the statistical distributions used to model the emphysema and the normal lung tissue. And here for the cardiac scan, we came up uh, very quickly to realize that we needed uh, did also to use some subject-specific um, parameters, especially for the uh, normal lung tissue uh, mean values, as it varies a lot uh, between scanner types, and, um, and this is uh, easily inferred by the outside air value in uh, individual scans. So in terms of validation of this segmentation, again, we don't have any ground truth. So we exploited two things that was available in our data. First, for uh, some uh, subjects, we had two repeated cardiac um, scans acquired uh, at the same visit. And that's really gold, uh, because you know here that uh, whatever your segmentic should be highly reproducible. So uh, we first looked at the population level um, reproducibility of percentage of emphysema measures. 
And here, um, this is again a nice confirmation that, that actually at the population level, if you look, if you compare personal emphysema in the first scan and the repeated one, um, any method being um, thresholding, uh, thresholding with filtering or uh, HMMF, you get a pretty high uh, reproducibility. But now if you look at the individual level, looking at the uh, dice overlap, so really pixel-wise overlap of what you have segmented in the repeated scans, then HMMF made a big difference and led to a very significant improvement of the dice value uh, compared to thresholding. And this is illustrated here on the overlapping maps um, of uh, emphysema uh, voxels segmented using thresholding, thresholding with Gaussian filtering, and again the, here the HMMF where you almost see uh, green, uh, you know, true overlap pixels basically, and very little disagreement. The second thing we did as an evaluation is to exploit the fact that we had longitudinal cardiac scans in exam one to four, and uh, versus and again uh, and then a full long scan in exam five, and uh, uh, so we looked at the uh, pairwise uh, correlation value on those longitudinal scans within a very short time period of eighteen months, and among normal subjects where you expect a very uh, small increase in personal emphysema. And this is what, we, what you can see here is that the baseline uh, cardiac exam and the uh, follow-up exam, uh, cardiac exam. You see, well, on the population level, again, our thresholding is not so bad, and, uh, but um, emphysema seems to be uh, slightly uh, more correlated, and that's confirmed by the numbers here. But at the, going to, again, the individual level, if you want to really follow the um, individual um, base in, increase in or progression in emphysema over time, and here this is uh, uh, comparing also for uh, this, doing this evaluation for normal subject and for disease subject, well, you clearly see on the blue lines here that you get a steady increase and, as expected, um, increase of emphysema over time using the uh, HMMF segmentation, and also that disease progress more than normals. While uh, for the thresholding, well, it's not too bad uh, if you remain in the cardiac scans. When you switch to the full lung scan and you compare personal emphysema, you, you see a major you know, problem here and um, an unrea realistic decrease in personal emphysema. All right, so once we had this segmentation tool, then we are ready to do um, domain adaptation and uh, what we call unsupervised domain adaptation with adversarial learning, UDA. Um, so the idea here is that you have we, have, we work with two domains, a source domain and a target domain. So the source domain is uh, those, are those synthetic cardiac scans that we generated uh, by just downsampling the full lung CT scan. And the target domain are all the real cardiac uh, CT scans that we had. And um, equipped with that, uh, you can feed um, those RRIs to um, three uh, neural networks. The first one, which is the feature extractor, which works on, on, on both source and target domain. Then we uh, have a second network for the image classifier, which works on the ground truth labeling that we have. Uh, for this uh, source domain, and a third um, neural network, which is the domain discriminator, and which evaluates, um, which tries to discriminate between synthetic, between the two domains here, the synthetic scans and the real cardiac scans. And the loss function then is a balance between the classification uh, loss and the uh, uh, domain discrimination loss with this parameter alpha. So, oh yeah, and I mentioned, I forgot to mention that um, one, uh, it didn't work uh, immediately and uh, we were at some point a little bit desperate on why it was not working. And actually, one of the key things we have really to pay uh, more uh, care than we thought I, was on the sampling of uh, the ROI. So, and this is all explained in the paper, but basically we ended up with uh, trying, really paying great attention to where we were sampling for the same subject on synthetic and real cardiac scans so that um, they would be um, in good correspondence. All right, so uh, the data uh, we worked with is uh, detailed here. So um, the split for the training validation and test set was based on the full long CT scans available in the MESA exam 5. And once we had split our subjects into 
training validation and test set, we applied, you know, we selected the same subjects and their uh, cardiac scans uh, available ac across the different um, generations of exam from one to four. And um, the good thing is that uh, we are lucky enough to have enough samples that we were able to uh, distinguish um, training for actually three um, target domains, which are helical scans, MDCT uh, scanners, and EBT scanners. And you get, uh, you have the numbers here. And um, as you will see in the results, that was really key because actually those uh, target domains are really different and uh, really benefit from uh, uh, having a UDA trained uh, specifically for them. So how did we uh, evaluate uh, uh, you know, uh, the UDA framework and the quality of the labeling of emphysema subtypes on cardiac scans? The first thing uh, here is that we looked at, uh, so just focusing on the synthetic cardiac ROI in exam five, compared to the real cardiac ROI in exam you know, one to five, what we looked at, so this is really at the ROI level, what we looked at are two things, the, uh, what we call the accuracy in classification, so that's the SLTP classification accuracy on synthetic RI, and then the domain accuracy, which is the domain classification accuracy on real versus synthetic RI. And here we compared UDA to uh, the alternative approach with, with, to see the effect of the, this domain adaptation. So, and what we call CNN here is just using the first two networks um, without any domain discriminator um, encoded in NN3. And the last thing I'll mention here is this alpha max was optimized and um, determined by maximizing this um, accuracy, total accuracy, which is the accuracy of the classification minus the accuracy of the domain discrimination. And uh, this minus here, I didn't mention that, but this minus here is important because you, the, the whole goal and the whole um, concept here is that you want to work with features that are invariant in domains so that uh, are not capable of uh, being a good, uh, training a good discriminator between domains. So at the ROI level, uh, validation accuracy for SLTP labeling and domain classification in MESA exam 5 led to the following. And two things that we learn here. So if you look at the classification accuracy, what we can see is that uh, we get uh, you adding a domain adaptation to uh, the uh, labeler you know, uh, pipeline uh, leads to a slight decrease in SLTP classification accuracy uh, using again our supervised uh, ground truth cohort. On the other hand, uh, regarding the um, domain adap uh, adaptation, we can see here that um, uh, the UDA, uh, so again the lower the better, has a much lower and so much better domain discrimination accuracy for what we want to do. Uh, that alpha max varies a lot uh, across target domains and that uh, if you were just using the classifier features to do domain discrimination, then it does a much better job. So, um, which is uh, against what we wanted to do and use again the domain invariant features. All right, so um, moving on, uh, we then evaluated the SLTP labeling in MESA exam one to five at the individual level. So to do that, we did two things here that are uh, summarized in this table. First, we compared the um, labeling uh, using the synthetic data versus uh, real cardiac uh, scans that were available for the same subjects. And this is again use, uh, distinguishing the three target domain. And, um, for, and then we, we moved to the just comparison of uh, two real longitudinal cardiac scans where we uh, uh, identify the target you know, domains as for baseline and follow-up. And here you see there are pairs of cardiac scans where there's no domain change. And here, uh, finally, the pairs of follow -up baseline and follow-up where there was a, a, a change in the scanner type between the two. So this gives you an idea of the number of subjects available, the number of uh, SLTPs um, detected in those scans, so not always the 10 SLTPs are being um, uh, labeled. And finally, some two metrics, so uh, the chi-square distance between the SLTP histograms and the correlation uh, value between the uh, person SLTP um, in, the two, in the pairs of scan. Um, what is in bold uh, corresponds to significantly better performance and uh, basically UDA wins. Um, so domain adaptation, you know, confirming that domain adaptation 
really um, uh, is beneficial in uh, what we are trying to do and uh, uh, leads to um, higher correlation here and uh, also here especially so one of the great gain was um, when there is a, a scanner type changes as seen here where we both improve the correlation between uh, SLTP percentage of SLTP and the distance between the um, SLTP histograms and this was done sorry on pairs of MESA acquired within um, a limited amount of uh, time so that there shouldn't be too much progression and too much changes in the um, SLTP labels. All right, and the last thing I wanted to mention, this is a, 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 a short study we did uh, last summer where we actually went back to thinking about, um, you know, should we, could we try to do um, other things with those cardiac scans, like for example, super resolution or um, really some mapping between uh, uh, full lung CT scans and cardiac scans. And for that, again, what we are really missing is the apical part, because without this, we can't equip um, the, it, the lung with any spatial coordinate, and uh, then um, mapping becomes very difficult. And so uh, we did this uh, small experiment that I wanted to mention to you um, today, which is using GAN to uh, infer from a cropped uh, view like this of the lung mask uh, to infer the full mask. And uh, those are illustrations uh, you know, of uh, typical results who were to obtain comparing to the ground truth, which is here. And uh, that was actually pretty uh, easy to train. And this led uh, very quickly to uh, you know, good, good visual results. So one of the tricky part was actually to figure out a good thresholding as we were generated uh, non-binary maps. And um, this is where it took a little bit of time on the validation set to come up with the best thresholding strategy. But overall, the die score are very high, uh, either for training, validation, and test set. And uh, so that's uh, a strategy we might pursue in the future. And I have to say, even if it looks like a simple uh, basic study, the clinicians would uh, find also a lot of uh, interesting uh, options um, by having such tools. So now I will conclude in two parts. First, what's next? Well, basically with the renewal of RNIH grant, we are now looking at what we call deep and molecular QES. We're working with the latest uh, generation of uh, MESA exam, called MESA exam 6. And uh, with that, we are first uh, now looking at uh, adding some temporal regularization in the labeling of our QES. Then we will uh, move toward deep QES by adding information from expiratory and angiography CT scans now available in the MESA cohort. And then moving on from deep QES to molecular QES by adding genetic information. And this is all again uh, still evaluated by the association with clinical symptoms. The second nice thing that we are uh, moving uh, toward is to use now a new cohort called CanCord coming from Canada as a replication cohort for all our uh, learning um, process. Uh, in the second part of the grant, we looked at explanted lungs with micro CT, which is uh, the graph basically, as you can uh, then confirm um, what uh, label QES has seen on CT scans really look like when you look at the tissues. And finally, the third goal is to go into the clinical world and translate our uh, quantitative emphysema subtype on uh, low-dose clinical scans. In parallel, we are working now uh, still in uh, the uh, concept of unsupervised uh, learning into quantitative airway tree subtyping. And in, uh, the goal here is to understand the role of uh, variants uh, as seen in the general population in COPD. The second thing, uh, part of my conclusion is on lessons learned that I wanted to share with you and in particular with the young uh, audience um, today. Um, and as a first message, I would really encourage you to discuss your method with clinicians as, as often as you can and learn to speak their language. Um, this is an invaluable resource. Uh, clinicians are usually very happy to discuss uh, methods, results and strategy to evaluate your results. And also, this is um, absolutely mandatory to really work very closely with clinicians if you want to write any grants such as uh, for the NIH. Know your data, so in particular, know the physics of imaging when you work with medical imaging. And on the other hand, don't assume too much regarding consistency in imaging, in particular when you're working with very large cohorts and with uh, CT scans that uh, evolve a lot um, in time. Ancillary studies um, and proposals can be an asset rather than a nuisance. 
I actually find it now very interesting and useful to agree uh, very much uh, ahead of time and on paper on uh, what we want to do using what data, what kind of method and what kind of evaluation uh, that uh, to be to, to use. And uh, the other nice thing is that you, when you work with Mesa and, and Spiromics, you're really part of, a, again, a, a big community of investigators that work on the same data. So, and when you get feedback from um, the committees reviewing your proposals, you usually get very interesting feedback. And also you, 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 you know that uh, everybody is aware of what you, you are trying to do and that uh, they're, they, you know, they, you're doing something that is different from um, other people. Finally, uh, small tasks such as measuring percent of physema or registering cardiac scans, which I didn't detail today, but we had to do at some point, are not first are not always easy, even even though they sound you know uh, simple and basic, and they can take you a very long way. And uh, this is what happened to us last uh, summer, where we were included um, in a big JAMA paper um, studying the influence of uh, air pollution on emphysema and lung function and where basically our measure of percentage emphysema with HMMF was used as a, a replication measurement uh, co compared to uh, thresholding confirming findings um, in this paper. Finally, um, dive into unsupervised learning. I hope um, I've convinced our, um, some, some of the people in the audience that this is an interesting adventure even though it's uh, very risky and it can sound frightening because again you have no idea of what you're looking for and what you're going to discover but uh, clinicians do uh, i think rely on us to uh, make really uh, great progress and impact in subphenotyping disease and that's basically the only way we can do that uh, deep learning requires human intelligence and especially when feeding the data and that's really, uh, that was really one big lesson to us when we worked with the UDA framework that uh, we had to pay more care than we were, we were doing when sampling arise uh, from the target and the source domains. A 10-year research cohort is heterogeneous, uh, definitely, but that's nothing uh, compared to clinical heterogeneity. So uh, keep always that in mind when you're trying to be uh, you know, too specific to a specific uh, research cohort. And uh, finally, um, I'll take this uh, opportunity to ask uh, reviewers in the audience that when you review unsupervised learning, be open-minded because, again, um, this is really challenging and this is really difficult. We were lucky to have a, a fantastic cohort of data to do this kind of work, but uh, not everybody has access to such data. And they are still, I think, very valuable unsupervised learning strategy to investigate. And finally, acknowledgements. Um, all this work was done in the Hefner Biomedical Imaging Lab at Columbia University, directed by Andrew Lane. And uh, mostly, most of the work was performed by uh, two PhD students, Chi Yong, who is now at Google, and uh, Iho Hammer, who uh, worked initially on the HMMF segmentation framework. Um, thanks also to all the other students here who uh, did uh, you know, some portion of the work. Um, this is, was done jointly with uh, Columbia University Medical Center and Graham Barr, who's the PI for the MESA and Spiromics uh, acquisition um, at Columbia University, and some uh, people of uh, his team and collaborators who uh, provided uh, um, all the, uh, especially all the association with uh, clinical symptoms. And external collaborators involving University of Iowa, in particular, Harry Kaufman and University of Virginia for the GWAS analysis. Again, thanks to NIH for funding this work and thanks to the MESA and Spiromics committees uh, for supporting our work, uh, being uh, positive on uh, all proposals we've submitted so far and having always very uh, uh, valuable feedbacks uh, for us. Thanks for listening. <laughs>